paid the ultimate price with their lives as we remember our Lord who paid the ultimate price. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for Jesus, our champion and our hero, who did pay the ultimate price. Um, Not only setting an example, but giving us a commandment to love one another as you yourself have loved us. Thank you for these men and these um, and women who have served this country and, um, and those who have given their lives in service. Thank you, Father. We honor you. We pray that you'd be honored in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Some announcements of what's going on around Warrington Bible Fellowship. The coat drive collection. This is the final week. So help is welcomed. I know they'd appreciate that. The final day for donations is Thursday the 16th. So that is this coming Thursday. Setup will be on Friday the 17th, and that starts at 2 p.m. Distribution, which again, all hands on deck, they will need help, is on Saturday the 18th. Let me get this right, from 8 to 11. My wife told me last week, she said, Philip, you said 8 to 8. I said, oh. So 8 to 11. And that yes, that is on the 18th. Operation Christmas Child, pick up a box. Start returning boxes tomorrow. Uh, the, The deadline to bring them back is the 20th. So get your box, go fill it with goodies, and bring it back. The link to volunteer is in the Monday Minutes and Friday forecast. The basics registration, selling out, possibly sold out at this point. As of last night, sessions only still. Okay. We checked it, but we didn't check it this morning. Okay. So link is in Monday Minutes and Friday forecast, and we can verify that for sure. And that is May 6th to 8th of in, uh, next year. So let Pastor John know when you sign up. And then on 1126, the Thanksgiving potluck. Bring your traditional leftovers or remake them into something creative. That would be fun. And then on Wednesday at 9 a.m., there's a verse meeting followed by the 10 a.m. planning committee meeting. Saturday, yes, 12-2, so not, not this month, but in December next month, and if I missed anything, I am sorry, I think that was all that was here, uh, see the Monday Minutes or Friday forecast, so double check, Kelly. That is um, Led by Josh, Josh Schaff. Yes. Tie one on class that he Tuesdays, does once right. a month on yes. uh, Tuesday. At seven? Thir- I think the third week of uh, the month. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, go out to that. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. That's all for announcements. Okay, awesome. Okay. Yay. Well, thank you, Philip. Appreciate that. And, you know, it's uh, amazing that we work together as a team to help each other because we all need people, the second set of eyes, really, truly, for all of us to make sure that everything is accurate most of the time. We are so glad you're here. Um, If you got the little announcement that came out yesterday that told you what the worship set was kind of being a a walkthrough of, I'm just going to give you a brief little overview in case you didn't get. It's kind of a walkthrough our normal life. Um, starting out with, I mean, as a Christian, we know that God is forever faithful, right? But then we hit these bumps in the road where we're calling upon the Lord to please help us, help us, help us. And then we hit this point also where it's like, okay, not my will, but yours be done, Lord. And I choose to worship you in the lowest valley. And I want you to be my vision. And even um, in the Be Thou My Vision, there was just a nice little surprise that God You know, he puts a song on your heart to sing, and all of a sudden you're going through it, and within the lines, raise thou me heavenward, O power of my power. And today's title of the sermon is More Power. So we're just so tickled when 
you can understand the uh, theology, the thought process behind a worship set so that maybe your heart can engage with the words a little bit more easily. Would you please rise?
the God of mercy hears our prayer.
same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God is never late. He's working all things. Working all things out. Yes, I will. And yes, I will. Lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will. Bless your name. Oh, yes, I will. Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will.
I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only be first in my heart. High King of Heaven, my treasure thou. Father, you are with us in every single moment. We thank you for your faithfulness, your steadfastness. Lord, we thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, even when we've known you for years and years and years and years, and we goof up and we shouldn't have. We bless your name, Lord, and we thank you, and we ask you to continue to be a part of this worship service. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm. That was beautiful. Thank you, worship team. As we have been offering our time, talent, and treasure to the Lord through our prayers, our singing. We now come to the time in our service where we give back of what the Lord has given to us financially. So we have three ways we can do that here at Orton Bible Fellowship. We can give through the boxes, let's say, an offering in the back and then downstairs. You can write a check, send it in through the mail to 46 Winchester Street, Orton, Virginia, 20186. Or you can give online at Secure Give. But I'd encourage you to give as Paul encourages us to do it as a cheerful giver, not under compulsion. So pray with me. Lord, bless the, the fruits, the first fruits as we give them back to you. Forgive us when we have not given of our first fruits. Would you enable us by your spirit to Give more generously, in Jesus' name. If you will direct your attention to the screen, we do responsive readings here at Warrington Bible Fellowship, and today we are doing the Apostles' Creed. So read with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, the Lord who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, 
the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Philip. Let me just give you a quick reminder. Um, we will start our new members class in two weeks. It'll be on Sunday morning uh, at 10 o'clock here at the church. Uh, if you're interested, we've got four people so far. If you're interested, please come and talk to me so we can get you on the schedule. I can communicate with you. And also, we will do another session of Apollos. Uh, I've talked about that several times in the last few weeks, starting in January. And so if you don't know what it is, if you want to know more about it, come and talk to me. Uh, we'll get you filled in and hopefully get you signed up for the class. I'd like you to turn to Philippians. We're in chapter 4. Oh my, we finish up today. Did you know that? Let me read this passage for you. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Reading of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Back when Kelly and I were part of a home church um, and we were forming a worship band, one of the first songs we did was a song called More Power. More power, more, you know. And so some of you uh, of my age probably remember that. And I, I, I used to love the song. Okay, you know, so, you know, we, we've been talking about power since last week. T today we're going to talk about more power. Uh, and I love that idea. And I want to tell you, uh, but between these two messages, you're going to find out that you have more power than you ever dreamed of. So if that excites you, there's going to be something interesting in here for you. The question is, the power for what? So last week we heard about three powers that Paul and every Christian has uh, in their new life in Christ. We have the power to unite, we have the power to strengthen, and we have the power to be pure, the power to be holy. Now these are all, we need to understand this, these are all attributes of Christ. They are who he is. They are what he's made of. And if you stop to think about it, Christ is unity, Christ is power, Christ is holiness. Of course, we have the same powers available to us because we're being formed into his likeness. So it's not just some magic wand that he's waving over us to make us more powerful. He's making us to be more like him. So this is why Paul constantly urges us to imitate Christ. Now, this week, we're going to see that those three powers are not the only powers we have in our new lives. Uh, we're going to see at least three more. Maybe we'll talk about more sometime in the future. So we're going to take a look at each one in today's sermon. And I've called today's sermon more power. Now, we're going to see three more powers we have as believers. The power to be content in verses 10 through 13. The power to be sanctified 
in verses 14 through 18, and the power to multiply. This one's going to be a little surprising, okay? In verses 19 through 20. Let's take a look at the power to be content. In verse 10, Paul says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you've revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. So the first thing Paul does is he wants them to know that he takes joy in knowing that the Philippians are concerned about him. They care about him. And he feels like he needs to clarify that thought. So he says he knew that they were concerned, but they had no opportunity. And so they they, they didn't seem to have the chance to show Paul about their concern. Now, we don't know why that is, but I'm thinking that they may have been distracted by the things that are going on in Philippi. Uh, There was trouble with the Jews. There was trouble with the Romans. They were a very small church. So it seems that Paul hasn't heard from them in a while. And he still has a strong feeling for them. There's, there's a bond with them. They're supporters of Paul. He's heard, had their encouragement in the past. And now they've sent him a gift. And this is Paul's response to that gift. We read about the gift in chapter 1. So Paul says in a roundabout way, your gifts remind me that you care for me. So don't miss the importance of this really short statement here because there's a life lesson in here. There, there's something for us all to benefit from. Paul's in prison. He's probably going to die there. He's suffering, and he has suffered greatly on his journey to get there. Now he finds out that those who are close to him those whom he loves, have been thinking about him all along. Maybe Paul was feeling a little bit lonely and lost. We see in his later writings, you know, these guys left, those guys are there, I've got Luke with me, send me my books. You see the comfort that brings, that reminder? You see the impact it has on Paul? Paul is strengthened by the encouragement of the body of Christ to the point to where He experiences this giddy joy we were talking about last week. There's flutters in his tummy. He's excited about this. You know, you know that you have that same capability? You can do the same thing? And, you know, we we, we have an active prayer network. We, We have a way to communicate with each other. We not only see each other on Sunday mornings, but we've got a prayer list. We've got a prayer page on Facebook, uh, we've got email, we've got text, we've got all of the new modern conveniences, and we can use them for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the body. And you need to know that every note you send out, every word of support that you offer somebody, every acknowledgement of their suffering and their hardship, not only encourages them the same way it did Paul, but it begins to knit us together to make us into more of a body. And Paul, Paul's saying there's a blessing in that type of encouragement. And so he gives them that. Your encouragement has been a blessing. And then he gives some encouragement to them that he's learned this valuable lesson. He says in verse 11, not that I am speaking of being in need. So while Paul deeply appreciates their blessing, he wants them to know that he's not in need. We need to think about that word for a second. It's an incredibly powerful word, isn't it? Need. In this context, it means that Paul's not lacking anything. Listen to that. Paul's not lacking anything. And even even as we read these words, we should be asking ourselves the question, do I lack anything? What, What do I need? And even as we ponder that, let me ask you this question. Do we ever confuse our wants and our needs? Oh, Paul, Paul's got a handle on this. He certainly has wants, doesn't he? I mean, he wants to get out of jail. (laughs) Nothing wrong with that. He wants his followers to live like Christ. 
He wants to see the Philippians. He wants encouragement. He wants people praying for him. He even wants to be at home with the Lord. He's told us that. But he doesn't have everything he wants. The big question is, what does he really need? What does he need? Now, Paul's been coming to terms with this issue for most of his Christian life. You can watch him wrestle with it. His wants and his needs have been right there in the forefront. And, and here's the amazing thing is what we've learned from Philippians, if we learn anything about Paul at all, is he's got this new life. He's got new life in Christ. But he doesn't have to seem, seem to have everything that he wants. Isn't the new life in Christ supposed to satisfy you? I mean, isn't it supposed to give us everything that we need? <laughs> or everything that we want? Wow. So Paul's struggling with this. He, he, he has everything he needs, but not everything he wants. And God has given him the things that he needs. Now, Paul needs Christ. He needs Christ. That's what he's been telling us all along. Literally, that's all he needs. He may have wants, but God has already given him everything that he needs. The question is this, is he satisfied? And that's the question that we have to answer. Are we satisfied with Christ? Or do we need something else? Or do we want something else? You know, uh, you know me, and I told you this before, I'm a compulsive collector. Somebody goes, oh, the new collecting craze is bottle tops. I'm out collecting bottle tops. And I want every bottle top that everybody wants. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I want the next one and the hard to find one. And, and I think that I need it. And, and you know, if, if you're a collector like me, you understand that the minute you get the thing that you want, that you think you need, you want the next one. <laughs> It never satisfies you. And so the scriptures tell us that we are to be satisfied in Christ, that God's grace is sufficient for us. That's the question. Is that enough? Do we need Christ plus something else? And so Paul is asking us this question is, are you content? Are you happy with what God has given you? Or do you think you have to have something else? Scripture clearly addresses all this. And, you know, if you take a look in the book of Hebrews in chapter 5, it tells us to be content with what we have. Now, that's a huge thing. Matter of fact, the New Testament tells us six times to be content with what we have. And the implication is this, is that if you don't have it, you don't need it. Oh, my See, this is why stealing and coveting are prohibited in the Ten Commandments. And it's not just taking or wanting something that you don't have, something that doesn't belong to you. God tells us that he's going to give us everything we need. When we want things, when we think we need things that we don't have, we're accusing God of not living up to his part of the deal. We're accusing him of not distributing things evenly. And then we kind of take things in our own hands and we go get it. Paul understands all this. He wants his spiritual children to know that he's blessed by their support and encouragement. This is a great thing. But he also wants them to know that God has supplied all of his needs. And though he's in dire straits and facing pain and torture, maybe even death. He's content. And he says so, second half of the verse, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Even in the situation he's in right now. Do you think think that might have an impact on the people around him? The people might see him being content with what he has, and begin wondering, how can it be content in these deplorable conditions? Someday we'll talk about conditions in a Roman prison. And just to be clear, Paul says this in verse 12, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. 
in any and every circumstance, comma. He's had it all. He's had fame, wealth. He's had status. And he's given it all up. He's been humbled. And even after he's humbled, what little he did have, he's either given away or it's been taken from him. He's been beaten, tortured, disappointed, betrayed, lied to, lied about, misrepresented, misunderstood, sick, stoned, and shipwrecked. And still he says, I have learned, listen to what he says, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Paul has learned the secret of dealing with life's ups and downs. Might that be useful? What is the secret? Come on, Paul. In verse 13 he says, This magic verse, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, this verse has been used for all manner of foolishness, hasn't it? But it has to be taken in context. And if you take a look at it, take a look at how 11, 12, and 13 of this chapter work together. They cannot be separated from each other. What I'm going to do is we're going to have a little bit of a responsive reading here. And we're going to read these chapters, these verses together. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. They'll be up on the screen here. Not that I, speak with me, not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. There's a secret to life. It's a secret to life. Right there in a simple phrase. The power to be content, and that's what Paul's talking about, amen? The power to be content with what we have is Christ in us. One of the foundations of the book of Philippians, isn't it? Christ who strengthens us. He strengthens us to do what? To deal with success. To deal with failure, with abundance, and with loss. Christ is the power to handle elation and joy and grief and disappointment and anything and everything that we endure until that moment we stand in glory. We have the power to be content. Wow. And in that regard, we should know that we also have the power of sanctification. Look at verse 14, second power. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Now, Paul's learned to be content. He wants to remind the Philippians of what's going on around him. He wants them to remind them that he appreciates and participates in unity with them. You see, this this message of unity keeps popping up. He's doing it with them. They were concerned for him. He says that's kind. Then he describes how deeply he appreciates it and and how it has blessed him. And verse 15, he says, And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. This church has encouraged and supported and financed the gospel in all of Macedonia. Paul's travels were rough after leaving Philippi. His stay in Philippi wasn't all that great to begin with. He was in prison there. You read about that in Acts 16. And after being released from prison, he went to a small town called Amphipolis and, and Apollonia. They're, they all kind of skirt the north of the Aegean Sea there, the northern part of Greece. And he's preaching the gospel every step of the way. And then they got to Thessalonica, a large city, where they encountered even more trouble. And the trouble in Thessalonica came from the Jews. And so Thessalonica was particularly hostile to Paul, It was a really rough time. He had to sneak out of the city. Didn't really receive his teaching all that well, but there were a few. And he says in verse 16, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help from my needs once and again. 
Philippians were steadfast if they were anything. They were faithful, steadfast in their support, steadfast in their encouragement. And again, they're a small church, didn't have a whole lot of resources. They're just trying to get by. They're actually fighting for survival in the environment that they were in. In the middle of this struggling to survive, they found some way to send support to Paul. As a matter of fact, the implication is that the Philippians were the only ones that did any support. And then Paul says, not that I seek the gift. That's not what I'm after. I'm not after your money, he says. But I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. What's he talking about here? Paul's saying it's not the money he appreciates as much as it is the fact that the gospel is being proclaimed and people are coming to the Lord. Maybe not a lot. Again, he, you know, he encountered all these troubles in these cities he were in, but there was always a remnant that he left behind. I love the fact that God deals with remnants, doesn't he? And, you know, we've got those remnant stories all through the Bible, Gideon. Oh, we got 30,000 guys. Let's go get them. Ah, that's too many. Okay, well, cut it down to 3,000. Right, God, now we can go, right? No, that's still too many. God, this is only 300 people. And we're going up against maybe 50,000 soldiers. God said, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we're going to do this so that I get the glory instead of you. There's always a remnant. And Paul's leaving these remnants throughout Macedonia. He's going to do the same thing as he goes down south into Greece, all the way to Corinth. So the fruit of the Philippians' conscience sacrificed and blessing. They made these conscious decisions to do this. The result of their active engagement in their faith the harvest of their participation in their own sanctification. You see, because as they participate in this, they're growing in their faith. They're seeing God move through these meager efforts that they're producing here. They're watching Paul do something amazing. And, and so they're growing in their faith. And the result of all that is the advancement of the kingdom of God. And Paul's excited about this. He, in verse 18, he says, I received full payment and more. I am well supplied. This is the guy in prison with nothing. Amen. Having received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. See, the gifts that the Philippians sent have met some of the wants of Paul. But God supplied his needs. They've allowed him to continue in his calling as a preacher and a teacher. They've helped him plant more churches seen more converts. And, and look at this. The sacrifice of the Philippians is a... Have you ever thought, you know, when Philip does his prayer for the, for the collection, when you send a check in, uh, when, when we do something online, uh, when we support the, the Christmas boxes, have you ever thought that that is a fragrant offering to our Lord? That's what it says right here. It's a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. It pleases God. It blesses him. Might not feel like a blessing when you're writing the check, but God says that's a fragrance to me. That is a sacrificial offering that blesses me, and I will bless you. Now, this isn't about getting rich because you're making donations. It's about the advancement of the kingdom of God on our backs as sacrificial offerings. And that pleases God. It blesses him. It's a spectacular display of the power of sanctification because normal people don't do these things. Only people that have been transformed, only people that have been regenerated, only people that are being motivated by the Holy Spirit. And the Philippians have been regenerated. They've been made new. They have the new lives that Paul speaks of, and this is what it looks like. And the evidence of their transformation is their evident growth in holiness, put on display by their steadfast determination 
to sacrificially support the kingdom of God. You know, you're going to get a chance to see the results of your sacrificial support to the kingdom of God. The video is coming next week. Okay? And, you know, in many ways, we are the Philippian church to Pastor Ovidio. Not, we don't say that in a prideful way. Amen? Okay? We say that humbly to see what, what God has done with what we have gifted Ovidio with. And you're going to hear some amazing stories. So he'll be here for Sunday school and for the sermon period. So I, I just suggest that we give him as much support as we can. Let's fill these pews up. And we need to understand that, that this, this attitude, this attitude of sacrifice, this, this participation in sanctification is not a supernatural, mysterious event. It is a conscious decision. And the Philippians have made a conscious decision to work with Paul using their resources for the sake of the gospel, to bring others into the kingdom of God, who will then have the opportunity to do the same thing. You see how that works? Philippians have been saved. You get this? Philippians have been saved and now participate in their salvation, participate in growing their faith and obedience by being proactive in doing God's work. And as they grow in their own sanctification, their own process of being made holy, as their priorities change, they then begin to see others transformed and sanctified as well. This is the power of obedience. This is the strength of making a conscious decision to live for Christ, not just in the area of giving, but in all the other areas of our life. Making that decision and then acting on it, you grow in your faith. And as that occurs, others are blessed and begin to grow in theirs. That's the power of sanctification. Look at the result of sanctification. We exercise our power to sanctify and be sanctified. And then we see the power to multiply. Oh, I've been waiting to get to this one. (laughs) Because I think that if I put $10 in the collection plate, God's going to give me a hundred back. Matter of fact, I was taught early on that he'd give me a thousand back. What a great investment plan. I can't tell you how many ten dollars I put in those things. I'm still waiting for them. (laughs) Listen to this, the power to multiply. Verse 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The Philippians decided to be obedient. They decided to participate in the work of the Spirit, to take part in the building of the kingdom and meet Paul's needs. They decided to meet the needs of another, and now God will meet their needs. God will do it according to his riches and glory in Christ. That's a beautiful phrase. In other words, God is going to meet their needs by opening the windows of heaven and pouring out all of the blessings and resources of God's creation upon his people. Oh, I love that. Now, what Paul's saying is this, and we we have to be really careful with this, because whatever resources we have, and what he's speaking of is spiritual, heavenly resources. Not necessarily material. Whatever resources we have that are spiritual, that are heavenly, that are godly, they will be added to. And as they are added to, the kingdom of God will continue to grow and the number of saved souls will multiply. And for all this, lest we think too much of ourselves. Verse 20 says, To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. God not only gets the glory, he makes it all happen. (laughs) And he does it all for his glory. He blesses us with the power to multiply for the sake of the gospel, for the glory of God. And then Paul ends with this, this really incredible blessing Verse 21, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Again, 
greet every saint in Christ. You see about all of us, talking about unity. The brothers who are with me greet you. There's fellowship there. So we see unity, we see fellowship. Then we see this incredible statement. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. What? The emperor's staff, family, are saints. They've been saved. Paul is in prison in Rome, and he's witnessing to the people that are living with Caesar, and they're responding to it. I told you before, if you want to change things in this world, don't go down and demonstrate. Go down and and share the gospel with the people in D.C. You want to see a change in, in the media, go share the gospel with the people who own the companies. You know, all of this, oh, we got to do this and we got to do that and everything is not sharing the gospel. Paul's in prison. They're going to kill him. He's got his opportunity. He's talked to kings and governors and everything. And at every turn, he has stopped and shared the gospel. Now he's in Rome and he's got access to Caesar's family. And what's he doing? He's not saying, tell Caesar to get me out of here. I'm, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm innocent. Will you do something to help me? He said, have I told you about Jesus Christ? And they're getting saved, which means that Caesar hears the gospel. Duh. Now it's on him, right? <laughs> Paul's done what he's supposed to do. There's a church in Rome And some of the members of that church live with Caesar. He finishes with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Final blessing of grace. Brings an end to Paul's letter. It's an incredible letter, isn't it? We've seen these three powers, three more powers. The power to be content. I think we need to realize that we have the creator of the universe living inside of us. That's a pretty incredible thought. And he knows what we need before we ask for it, doesn't he? Doesn't he say this? He strengthens us to be able to be content with him and him alone. So we've seen this power to be sanctified. Salvation is a sovereign move on behalf of God, but we get to participate in our sanctification. And that's a series of conscious decisions that we make as we exercise the power of sanctification by being obedient to what we've been called to do, God begins to multiply our spiritual, our kingdom-oriented resources. Now, a lot of people teach that God is going to multiply earthly resources. But let, let me tell you, you, you people are biblically astute. You've been reading your Bibles. With what we know about the character and nature of God, which what, with what we know about how he functions, do you really believe that God's concerned with your bank account? Do you really believe that God is concerned with how big your car is or how big your house is or how big your, your IRA is? Is, is that God saying, well, I, I want you to have enough money to be happy? With what we know about God, do we think he has given us the power to multiply our stuff or his. Ah. And do we do it for our glory or for his? Don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with having money. It's not money that is the root of all evil. Amen? What's the root of all evil? The love of money. We do it for his glory. Scripture tells us we do it for his glory. And, and you know, if you think about the narrative arc of the Bible, we made all creation. He put that tree in the garden. We'll talk about that someday. He had a plan of redemption for his children. He sent his only son to die, to pay for our sins, to save us. And throughout the Bible, God says, I've done this for my glory. So his glory will be revealed. Now, now, you know, at first, that, that's maybe, maybe we have a rough time with that. That he saved us for his glory. We're saved, but watch this. 
We're saved as part of God's plan to bring glory for himself. So as God glorifies himself by revealing his holiness, his character and nature to all of his creation, we get caught up in God bringing glory to himself. What a blessing that is. Praise God. We have, we have more power than we ever dreamed of. It's beyond our imagination. If we understand what we read in Paul's letter to the Philippians, it's the power to overcome. But here's what we're overcoming. Ourselves. We are overcoming ourselves. We're not in a battle with Satan. That's up to God. Amen? We're in a battle to harness these powers we've been given for the glory of God, not for our own benefit. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. That battle he has between his spirit, what he wants to do, and his flesh, what he does. And now he tells us that Christ in him enables him to overcome that for the glory of God. So we've got the power to overcome ourselves, our own stubbornness. We have the power, we have the power to be obedient, the power to pursue holiness, participate in our sanctification, the power of Christ in us. And Paul tells us that it's worth giving up everything. It's worth the loss of all things to embrace that power. Praise God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for this this holy definition of power and how it impacts our lives, Father. May we have a vision for this, a bigger vision than for what's going on around us, Father, what's going on in us, but what is happening in the heavenlies, what is happening in all creation, as you reveal yourself step by step to everybody, Father, and offer up the gift of your Son, that we might be redeemed, Lord, that we might be transformed, that we might be regenerated, Father, that we might be able to participate in our sanctification to your glory. And we pray this in his precious and holy name, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I'd like you to stand for benediction, please. Bow your heads. This is out of Acts chapter 20, verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Praise God. Have a great day. We'll be back with a video next week. Thank you for tuning in, those of you who are online.